So many physics problems can be really hard to solve even on the best of days. But the most frustrating thing is when you finally, finally understand what's going on and get to the end of your problem and then you realize you've made a mistake somewhere. Well, worry no more or at least worry a little bit less because I've got a few tips for you to help you solve physics problems. Hey you lot, my name's Path and I make fun physics videos though I don't have to try too hard because physics is already fun. Today I'm going to be giving you three tips to help you make fewer errors when you're trying to solve physics problems. Now in this video I'm not going to be talking about things that will help you understand what the question wants or anything conceptual like that. That's for another video. Instead, the tips I'll give you today are going to help you systematically solve physics problems. So let's not waste any more time, let's jump straight into it. Tip number one. Now, tip number one for solving physics problems is what my university lectures used to call sanity checks. When we're working through physics problems, you guys all know this, it can be really easy to get lost in the maths and the algebra. And you just follow it through and you find your answer and you just leave it there. We get to a point where we've got an answer and we just stop thinking about the problem because that's it, right? We've got an answer, we've solved the problem. No, 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 no. Instead of doing that, take a minute at the end of every sort of long problem that you solve to do a sanity check. Think about the answer and make sure it makes sense. Hence, it's called a sanity check. Now, what do I mean when I say make sure it makes sense? Well, I think the best way to explain what I'm talking about is to give you an example. Let's say we're considering the speed of a particle. Let's say this is our particle here and we're trying to work out its speed in our problem. Now, let's say we work through all the algebra, you know, whatever it may be, and we found the speed to be 400 million meters per second. Now, you're probably sitting there thinking, hang on, that's a ridiculously fast speed. But just the fact that it's fast shouldn't be what bothers you. Because remember, we're studying a particle. If anything is likely to travel at really high speeds is something with very low mass, such as a particle. But what should really be bothering you, and is probably bothering some of you watching this video, is the fact that it's traveling at 400 million meters per second. That means it's traveling faster than the speed of light, which is 300 millimeters per second. So it's not the fact that it's traveling fast that's the problem. It's the fact that it's traveling faster than light, which as far as we know, is not possible. Remember, Einstein's theory of relativity tells us that it's not possible for any object with any mass to even reach the speed of light. So how can our particle be traveling faster than the speed of light? As far as we know, there's no evidence at the moment to suggest that Einstein was wrong about this. So we have to assume that we've done something wrong in our calculations. And as soon as you get to the point where it's your word against Einstein's, you're probably, <laughs> you're probably doing something wrong. So our sanity check involves looking at the answer and going, hang on, this doesn't make sense for whatever reason. In this case, it's because our particle turned out to be traveling faster than the speed of light. Now, there are a couple of possibilities here. Either we've gone wrong somewhere in the algebra, we've probably made a numerical error, or wrongly manipulated some of the variables. Entirely possible, in which case it's worth looking back over the algebra and making sure it's right step by step. Or we've done everything correctly numerically, but we're working in a different set of units and we've accidentally used the wrong units. This fix is much simpler because you just need to change the units, but it could be either one of those things. However, if you'd just done the maths and got the answer and not thought about the answer making sense, then you haven't even given yourself a chance of catching your mistake. Whereas any sanity check that you do is going to increase your chance of being correct. Okay, so that was tip number one. Now, before we go into tip number two, I wanna quickly ask you guys something. Drop me a comment down below telling me what your routine is when you're studying physics. What do you do day to day? What's your preferred way of studying physics? Let me know in the comments down below. The reason I ask this is because I want all of us in the comments to sort of share with each other any tips so that we can compare our study techniques with other people and maybe try new things or also realize that some things might not be working for us. That way we probably make our learning a little bit more efficient by just helping each other out. So let me know down below, what's your routine for when you're studying physics? Also, I'm gonna be cheeky. Leave a thumbs up if you're enjoying the video so far. Okay, anyway, let's move on to tip number two. Tip number two is known as dimensional analysis. It consists of two things. Firstly, expressing all the units that you've been given in base units or SI units. So we change everything into the units of things like mass, distance, time, current, and so on and so forth. And we can find a list of these base units or SI units in the description below, I'll link you down there. Secondly, any calculation that you do, any quantity within that calculation, you track its units. That means that you don't just plug the numbers in when you're doing the maths, you plug the number in with the unit. Or you can use dimensional analysis, having known the units of a certain quantity, to work out how that quantity relates to other quantities that you've been given. Now, I realize that sounds very complicated, so again, let's take an example. A simple example will do. Let's say we've been asked to find the force on an object, having been given the mass of that object and the acceleration experienced by that object. Now, obviously, the relationship that we're looking for here is Newton's second law of motion, F is equal to ma. By the way, I made a video on Newton's second law. Check it out here if you haven't already. Anyway, back to this video. Like I said, we know the relationship we're looking for in this question is F is equal to ma. Now we know the mass of the object and we know the acceleration. 
So clearly all we have to do is to multiply them together to find what the force on the object is. But here's the thing, we might make a mistake, we might accidentally do something wrong, but if we stick our units in with our calculation, then it'll make life a lot easier. So let's say the mass of this object, whatever it may be, is two kilograms. And let's say it's accelerating at five meters per second squared. Now we need to multiply the mass of that object by the acceleration to find the force on it, like we said already. Now, when we go to do our calculation, if we actually stick the units in our calculation, so instead of saying two times five, we say two kilograms times five meters per second squared, and we treat the units just like a component of the calculation. We multiply all the numbers together and we multiply all the units together to give us 10 kilograms meters per second squared. And we know that kilograms meters per second squared is the same thing as a newton. But let's say we accidentally did something wrong. We multiplied the mass by the acceleration squared just by accident. Well, if we did that, we'd have two kilograms times five meters per second squared whole squared. And at that point, we'd get a numerical answer, which would be 50 but we'd also get kilograms meter squared per second to the power of four. And that's not the same as the units of a force. So tracking our units in our calculations will make life so much easier for us because it'll help us spot any errors. Here's a slightly more concrete example for you as well. The force on an object moving in circular motion is known as centripetal force. Now let's say that we're told in a question that the force applied on this object, the centripetal force, is given by multiplying the mass of the object by the speed of the object squared divided by the radius of the circle that is traveling in. What we're trying to do is to convince ourselves that this is correct. Now, if we consider the units, convincing ourselves becomes a lot easier because we know the units of force. The units of force are newtons, but in base units, they're kilograms meters per second squared, as we've mentioned already. So we take the right-hand side of this equation, mv squared over r, and we take all the units from all of those quantities. So what are the units of mass? Kilograms. What are the units of velocity? Meters per second. But remember, we've got velocity squared. So we've got kilograms times meters per second, whole squared, and we divide it by the unit of the radius, which is a distance. So it's going to have a unit of meters. So altogether, what do we have? Well, we've got kilograms multiplied by meters squared divided by second squared divided by meters. Canceling all of those things down, we've got kilograms meters per second squared. And that's the same as the unit of a force. So it makes sense for us to be calculating centripetal force with the equation F is equal to mv squared over R. So dimensional analysis, difficult to say, really important to use. Let's take a little interlude where I can clean my glasses so I can see you guys a bit better. And we're back. Now, the third tip that I have for you guys is probably more of an everyday sort of a thing that works for quite a lot of things, not just solving physics problems. I use this tip all the time in everything that I do, whether it's music or making videos or badminton or physics. And so it's not very much specific to physics, but it will really, really help you with physics. So tip number three, you know the situations where you've been working really hard all day or even for a few hours at some physics and you feel like you've learnt a lot, but you're really starting to struggle now. Your brain isn't cooperating as you'd want it to, you know, you're not understanding things that originally were very easy to you, or even you started tangling yourself up about stuff that really isn't that important in the question or in the problem that you're doing. Maybe something that was clear to you yesterday is no longer clear to you for whatever reason. When you get to that point, step away from the physics. Step away from it. Go away, go for a walk, go for a jog, go for a swim, go for a badminton, go for a music. I realize I've used mostly sports analogies. Go for some art, go for some music, go for some dinner with friends, go for some time with the family. Just get away from the work. Don't sit there and force yourself through it. Let your brain make those subconscious connections it needs to make whilst also allowing it to refresh itself a little bit. Stepping away from the problem works for two reasons. Like I said already, your brain will make subconscious connections whilst you're thinking about something else. Secondly, you're allowing your brain to rest a little bit. You're gonna come back refreshed, ready to go and rearing to attack the problem. And like I said, I do this in everyday life. I do this when I'm doing badminton, music, making videos, everything. For example, when I'm making music, if I've been working on something for the entire day and I'm working on mixing some tracks together, it gets to a point where my ears are a bit fatigued. Something sounds louder than it should be. Something doesn't sound loud enough. And I get caught up on this really almost unimportant detail, which if I had fresh ears, if I'd gone away for a little while and come back to it, I would have just been like, yeah, this is not a problem and moved on and finished my song. And the same is true for physics. You gotta let your brain rest for a little while and come back and attack the problem. Not only will you be more enthusiastic about trying to solve the problem, but maybe your brain has solved it subconsciously. So allow yourself enough time to do that. And again, this doesn't apply for if you're cramming for a physics exam the next day, but this applies for general revision or studying or trying to understand physics concepts throughout the year. And that was my third and final tip for this video. So there you have it. 
Guys, I hope you enjoyed those tips. I hope you find them useful as well. Let me know in the comments down below which one you're going to use first. And after having used any of them, let me know if they work for you. Now, I'm going to make another video at some point looking at the conceptual side of things a little bit more. You know, stuff like how to understand what the problem actually wants from us, that kind of thing. But I hope you'll find the tips that I've given you today useful. So give them a try. Maybe they'll work for you. Also, don't forget to tell me down in the comments below what your routine for studying physics is like. And if you enjoyed this video, guys, please leave a thumbs up. I would really appreciate it. Feel free to subscribe if you haven't already and hit that bell button to be notified every time I upload. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I'll see you really, really soon. Bye, 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 bye. I've got myself a new ring light, and honestly, I can't see shit.